So here's an overview of the pipeline. Well, we get data down from JWST, and there's three stages of the pipeline. And then uh, uh, we put the results into the archive. And I'll note that at every stage, there are results that go into the archive. And so the first stage is detector one. Um, this is where we work on the ramps, right? So these are, and turn them into uncalibrated slopes by fitting lines. And I'll get, I'll talk more about each stage in more detail uh, in, in just a few moments. That's the first stage. The second stage, we're still working on individual uh, exposures or integrations. And, and now that's where we're doing things like flat fielding, et cetera. And then stage three, uh, that's where we're, for imaging in particular, that's where we're making mosaics and doing source extraction. Right, so that's kind of the, the steps through. I do want to point out that um, one of the things that's different about the JWST pipeline than many previous uh, um, observatories is, notice there's no instrument names involved in this pipeline at this stage. It turned out because we're, um, we're, you know, four, actually five instruments are coming online at once, made a lot of sense and they have a lot of overlapping similar observation modes. And so it made more sense to organize by the type of observation than by instrument. We actually were able to save quite a lot of development and, cro and we cross-fertilized ideas and algorithms between instrument teams, et cetera. All right, so what is what one of, the, one of these stages looks like? Here's what detector one, the details of all the steps in detector one. As you can see on the inputs are the near infrared and mid infrared ramps. Those are the two different kind of detectors that we have on JWST. Um, and so they have different instrumental artifacts. And so you can see there are steps in the, in the blue that are both in common, the ones in the middle and ones that are, that are actually separate and different for each type of uh, detector. And so I've actually circled some of the mid-infrared only steps, first frame and last frame correction. But then there are also steps that because it's very similar kind of data, we get every, all the detectors produce these ramps. Then there's a jump detection step that we do on all data. And you can actually see the columns on either side show you which instrument, which steps are actually run for a particular instrument or even uh, an instrument mode. TSO in this case is the time series observation. And what we get out of this is uncalibrated slope. So this is DNs per, DN per second per pixel. So the next two steps, uh, image two, this is actually uh, showing you what's in there. This is straightforward stuff for image two. You know, you add your pointing information, do background subtraction, flat field, flux calibration. Still working basically on individual images at that point, individual exposures. Image three is when you go to a group of exposures or ensemble of exposures. And now you're going to actually do things like mosaicing and refine uh, offsets between images and do a source catalog. So now I'm going to go through a, uh, each one of these three stages in a bit more detail. So this is detector one. Um, many of the instrumental level artifacts are corrected or accounted for here. Um, there's a number of differences, as I already said, between the near and mid infrared detectors. They're just different materials and technologies. And I'm only going to discuss a few of the detector one steps. I think the ones that are particularly interesting for people to think about. So the first off, I do want to say a bit about what the basic data that comes down from JWST is, T is for all the instruments and all the detectors. And that's this um, ramp, right? So in fact, um, unlike CCDs for the near infrared, mid infrared detectors, you can actually sense the number of electrons in a pixel without actually destroying the number of electrons. You don't actually have to read it out and destroy it. And so you can actually sense it multiple times during exposure. And one of the ways of doing this is in a, a regular sampling. And so you sample it every group time, basically. Um, and so then you basically, because the flux is in general accumulating linearly over time, that you get a line. You actually sense it and you get a nice ramp. And what we're looking for is what's the slope of that ramp? How many dn per second or how many electrons per second did we detect? Because that's the basic measurement we're looking for. And in, in an exposure, you can have multiple integrations, so you can do a reset, which actually clears the charge from the pixels, and then you continue to accumulate additional charge. All right, so one of the nice things about this is uh, we can actually detect in, in, inside of an integration if groups have become saturated, and then we'll just flag those groups as saturated and not use them when we actually fit for a ramp, fit a line to the data. So this gives uh, near these near and mid infrared detectors a larger dynamic range than a more standard CCD. 
Um, there's also the other thing about these detectors, they all have reference pixels around the periphery. So these are pixels that just don't see light. And so they actually track the variations in the electronic baselines. And so they can actually be used. You basically average them and subtract them on a group by group basis. And you can remove some of this electronic drifts. First, we all, another thing we do is uh, correct the, uh, make the ramps linear at this stage. So linearity correction um, based on our reference file. And they're, for all the detectors, they're well characterized by a sum of low order polynomials. One of the other nice things we can do because we have the ramps is if you have a cosmic ray hit a pixel, what that does is actually inj inject a step function in the ramp, which I show here. Um, and we can actually detect that step, right? That's a step function. We can flag that there's that there. And then when we get to the slope fit step, we can just fit before and after the cosmic ray step and average the results. So we can actually recover from that cosmic ray in that pixel. And then what we do is the final step here really is to calculate the slope. And so this is actually just a, um, a linear fit, a weighted linear fit to the ramp, uh, the linearized ramp where we've detected all the bad stuff um, and, and ignored it. Um, and so we act, the weight, weights are actually based on the read and photon noise model, which we know is a really good model for these kind of detectors. And we not only calculate, and we calculate an uncertainty based on that fit both the total uncertainty and we also keep the read and photon uncertainty term separately. And we will be propagating that through the pipeline. That turns out to be useful later in later stages of the pipeline to actually have the uncertainty terms as well as the total. So that's, that's the end of detector one. So now we've got these uncalibrated slopes in DN per second. So now we're gonna calibrate them. That's what image two really does. Um, so here are the steps we're gonna do and I'll go through each one here. So the first one, we add the uh, generalized world coordinate system to the data. This is the equivalent of the FITS WCS and distortion information. You might be familiar from previous uh, observatories. And this is determined from the observatory telemetry, right? Uh, JWST knows where it's pointing. Now we do, there's a, a optional background subtraction here in the sense that if you, the dedicated background images have been taken in the same filter, i.e. if you, are observing on top of a galaxy and you want to subtract the background off the galaxy and you've got those observations set up with APT. And if there are, well, that, this will do an image by image subtraction. If there are multiple background images, it combines them with sigma clipping before you subtract it. And that's done in detector coordinates to get rid of sources. Next one is to do the flat field. This is the correct, is, you know, the flat field is a standard thing, right? It corrects for variations in the responsivity illumination and pixel sizes. And so just to point out, this really transforms the basic unit that of, of our measurement uh, to surface brightness per average sized pixel. Um, so this is just divides by the appropriate flat field in the reference file. This also imposes a mask in the flat field that removes the non-active regions. That's actually not true. It just flags the non-active regions. Um, this also, this is the third term we actually keep track of in the pipeline at this point which is the flat field uncertainty term, which is added to the associated un uncertainty information. And so now we have three terms in the uncertainty, um, in our uncertainty model plus the total that we're now going to propagate through the pipeline through all the unit changes that come. And the, one of the big unit changes is we apply the flux calibration that's been determined by looking at calibration stars, et cetera. And this is all provided by a reference file. And so now when we apply this calibration, the units are in Megajanskis for steradian. And this supports both point and extended source science uh, directly. And so that's, it also reflects that this is the surface brightnesses are the inherent unit of flat field in images. And of course, all the error terms we update for this unit change. So they, they follow the data. Finally, the final step in image two is to do this rectify 2D product, provide, provide a rectify 2D product. This is an archive product only. We don't actually use this later in the pipeline. Um, and this just is applying the distortion solution to create an image that doesn't have distortion, right? That has uniform sized pixels. All right, image three. Now we're into um, combining groups of images together to learn more, you know, get, get better data and make nice mosaics, etc. All right, so the first step is to refine the, the world coordinate system. 
So this is, we, we actually have uh, a lot of point sources in the images, and so we can use the location of these point sources to update the observatory information effectively of where we, where we were pointing. And you can do this through uh, updating the relative GWCS through sources in overlap regions, right? Find all the sources, see how they overlap, see if there's a shift that's needed to be applied to get everything to line up in relative sense. And then there's a, the next step is to do an absolute update, which is based on comparing sources in the images to um, astrometric catalogs, especially Gaia, right? And so this should ensure that we have very, very fine, both relative and absolute um, coordinates for all the images. Next step, and this is one of the things we've learned from previous missions, what not to do and what we should be doing is uh, uh, supporting moving targets uh, from the get-go. And so we're doing that for JWST. And so if it's a moving target, there's a global world coordinate system that's actually added that tracks the moving target. And so the idea there is this is very nice. Then all the latter stages of the pipeline just need to know to use for moving targets this world coordinate system. And then all the rest of the software works. You can mosaic in that coordinate system i.e. making that, you know, making a mosaic of your planet or asteroid or your moving target of interest. Next step is to do background matching where you have overlapping regions. You can equalize the background using those regions. Uh, fairly straightforward step. And but what we do is we actually just save that information in the image info headers. We don't actually update the images at this stage so that we can use it in latter steps. Now you've got everything lined up and the backgrounds are all uh, set up well. So now we can detect outliers using the overlap regions. Um, and so this is one step that uses that delta background to adjust things before detecting outliers. This is a more standard outlier detection step you might have, you know, might have seen from CCD work or previous stuff, where you basically just do the, you know, average and and look for things that are deviant by n sigma, where you set the n sigma to some threshold. Um, this. Algorithm also includes a term to account for interpolation errors when you have spatially undersampled data. Um, and the outliers are then flagged and then not used downstream. Now that we get to the step, you know, mosaicing, you've done all this work, now we can actually make a really nice high quality mosaic. And so just combining them all from the same filter into a single mosaic, you use all that information you've done. This uses a standard uh, mosaicing algorithm, effectively drizzle with PIXFRAC equals one. And we do use weights here, um, and we don't use the total weights. Or we, we only use the read noise uncertainty term to avoid the biases, the known biases of if you use uh, an uncertainty term that includes photon or flat field uh, noise in it. And so this weight should work uh, well in the read noise dominator regime to combine you know, images of different uh, integration lengths, et cetera, but also do a good scaling, a reasonable scaling, even in the photon dominated regime. Um, we have some ideas of how maybe to improve this, but this should work uh, for the baseline. And we also create uncertainty mosaics, right, doing standard error propagation. So you'll also get a mosaic that gives you four mosaics, that one gives you the total uncertainty, and then photon, read noise, and flat field terms, so that you can use that in your analysis. And then we do, we make a source catalog, look at that mosaic, find, do a catalog of point and compact sources, standard aperture photometry algorithms, and you get aperture and corrected to infinite aperture, flux densities, and Janskys from that catalog. It's not necessarily meant, neither the mosaic nor the source catalog is necessarily meant for what you might use for your science, but it might be good enough for your science and it might be what you need. And if nothing else, it hopefully will get you started. And finally, we've, we've, we've improved things in our knowledge of the individual exposures, the backgrounds, the relative, uh, the, the global war, world coordinate system, outliers, and so we update the exposure level products to have that information in case, you know, for people who want to work on those exposure level products, you have the option of using this extra ensemble information. So finally, to give you a little picture to look at after all that text, um, here's kind of what you, you know, an imaging data set will look like coming out of the pipeline. Being in, in, in the archive, you'll have the individual exposures, um, which is shown there on the left. For Miri, and then you might have taken things in a 12 point dither pattern or whatever. And so you have a whole set of calibrated images, and then you can have a mosaic and, and um, a coverage map effectively from the uncertainty term. So that's it. There's more information uh, on each of the, on the algorithms on those particularly, at those particular URLs. 
And there's, of course, the code focus documentation that Alicia's already pointed out um, on Read the Docs.